Twitter. A U T T N E R. What? You're not on? I'm, okay, not I'm on now. Could you please repeat that, uh, sir? No, I'm not going to spell my name again. Yeah. Could you make phonetically? Up a, what's your what's you your can alias? Do it phonetically. You have an alias? No, I didn't have an alias. I had a. Uh, uh, the name that they credited me in the, uh, you know, to, in the paper, put out by, I don't know what we did, we had a little box, and so my nickname was Pito, P-E-T-O, and that came from the way that one of, uh, one of the kids, actually David, uh, who, uh, uh, was Stormy's kid, and Michael was helping to raise at the time, uh, called me Pito. So that became me. My partner in crime, uh, who became my wife and the mother of our revolutionary child, Leela, was known as Proud Mary. Okay. Yeah, you can monitor it. It's just one. It's monitor. But I used to, I mean, a lot of times I would introduce myself as Pete from Belmont Racine, which is uh, where we lived at the time. Which actually has a lot to do with uh, my involvement and what drew, what drew me. Thank you very much. You're very well. What drew me to the organization, which was that uh, I grew up. Uh, walking distance from Belmont Racine and I was a kid I was a kid from the neighborhoods in a in a funny way. I lived uh, near Wrigley Field. A, uh, an area they call Wrigleyville now, but we didn't call it that then we was known as over by the ballpark. Where do you live? Over by the ballpark. But you can't sell condos in an area known as over by the ballpark. Uh, I often think that, that there's, a, there's a special language in Chicago and it's all based on prepositions as in over by the ballpark. Let's go over by the ballpark. Maybe we should go down by the lake. Uh, and I gotta go pick up this guy out by the airport. Now, the key thing, do you want to come with? So the rule of not ending a sentence in a preposition is not working too hard. You have to use a preposition in every sentence you say. Um, which actually takes me off of the idea of where I was living to this idea of the language of rising up and Which would you prefer I talk about first? Well, actually, the language of it is very interesting. You're attuned to it. Let's talk about that. Well, the fact that I that I grew up in a neighborhood in Chicago and uh, up until the time I met Rising Up Angry had spent my entire life in Chicago except for a, uh, a short period um, uh, at, in the fall of 1967 through the early spring of 1968. But that time that I spent away led me right back to Chicago and and into eventually rising up angry and I'll I'll tell you that story but let's talk about the language because I think that that is if there is if there are remarkable things about rising up angry uh, and there are uh, one of the things is undoubtedly uh, our use of language that uh, we were in a position that we had to uh, sell some very unpopular ideas uh, right in the middle of the, uh, to a clientele, let's say, uh, that would be the least open to it. As in, we, we were against, not only against the Vietnam War, and against the American participation in it, we were also for the victory of the National Liberation Front of Vietnam, the Viet Cong, or in the words of some of the kids that we were trying to organize, the enemy. We were in neighborhoods uh, that were providing the fodder for the American uh, war effort. Uh, we were in poor and working class neighborhoods, which in the days of the draft were the kids who were going. Um, I think the uh, I think the lottery was the lottery in effect while we were. Oh yes. So, oh yes. So. 
even I don't know exactly when the lottery came in, but in in any event, a lot of the kids that we were talking to were too young to go, but they had brothers and and cousins uh, and uh, uncles and some even fathers who were over there. So we, when we go into the neighborhood talking about victory for the Viet Cong, we're saying the guys who are shooting at your family uh, and your friends, we want them to win. Just saying, we want them to hit them with the with the bullets. So we had to look for a way to do that that wouldn't get us beat up, uh, which was less important than trying to sell the idea. Because if we if we if you could get this is what the, the a lot of the anti-war movement was about. If you could get there were people working with soldiers, there were people working with draftees uh, to keep them from going or to turn around, turn the guns around, was one of the phrases at the time. So we needed to get some of those ideas out, so we needed to look for look for ways to do it, and ways to talk about it. Why was it uh, for the Vietcong to win? I mean, there's a lot of other parts of the spectrum, just withdrawal. And uh, I can't say that I recall, there, there were mentioned, but it was not the emphasis that the Vietcong should win or that well, in, a, in our end, in our, I wouldn't say faction, but at our end, in the left end of the anti-war movement, yes it was. Uh, ho, 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 Chi Minh, the NLF is going to win. Uh, go, ho. I mean, we were... Communists. Yeah, we were, for, we were for a communist victory because we thought of ourselves uh, sort of as communists ourselves. Uh, revolutionary socialists, maybe. I don't know, communist was an easy word to say for me because uh, I, I wasn't really an intellectual and I hadn't done a lot of reading into revolutionary theory. You asked a really good question yesterday that Tapas didn't answer, and that, or maybe he did later, but I'd like to you ask him. You know who who read about who knew about revolutionary theory so as to know what to do. Yeah. So, but let me get to that because I, I I I'd like to answer. Well, I did answer your question about yes, we de we definitely were looking uh, uh, for a victory. Now, if the victory came by just an American surrender and us pulling out so that nobody else would die, that would be great. We weren't looking for the soldiers to be beat. We were looking for America to pull out. But. To me, that's uh, you're playing you're playing with words now. That's the same thing that uh, that a, na a national liberation front victory in Vietnam would be uh, uh, would would cause what we wanted to happen, which was for the American soldiers to come home. Now, what we're talking about is the, is the uh, determination of a future state which can't do. But the intermediate states are if the American troops pull out, this this will happen or that'll happen. So but obviously there's an awful lot of people who were against the war just didn't want us involved. We, we don't know what's best for Vietnam. We know we shouldn't be there. Right. But we took it a step further. We believed that we did know that we agreed. We, it's not that we knew what was best for Vietnam, but we agreed with the Vietnamese who thought that a communist victory would be best for uh, for a, a unified Vietnam. We picked up on that. Uh, and part of that came from, you, you've heard a lot about uh, the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, and a part of that came from an idea that some of us brought to us, some of us, including myself, who had, had some involvement before Vietnam in the anti-war movement, which was um, uh, the idea that, uh, that it, it was the third world, it was the oppressed people of the world, uh, and even those oppressed people living within the, the borders of the United States, who would, um, and I include the Puerto Rican, the, the edges of the Puerto Rican island uh, as, as part of the borders of the United States, the oppressed people who lived there would be the ones we would be taking leadership from, would be the ones who would suggest the way uh, that we would go. So one of those communities was um, the Vietnamese community in Vietnam who favored a communist victory, and we supported that. So, and that a lot of some of that for some of us came from 
this idea that it would be those people who would lead it. If they say they want it, and it seemed like it did, it seemed like that whole country was against us. They, you know, there were some, there were some, for whatever their reasons, uh, who were forced into the South Vietnamese army. But it looked like the majority of the country wanted us. They all liked the Viet Cong. Yeah. Well, it's you know, just like Iraq, is that predicting the future state, well, they're going to argue with Kurd or Shia or Sunni or what faction. But the big thing is the U.S. military should not be there and they can cause nothing but trouble. So where did it, how did the discussions go? And I don't even know what your role is. Were you there with, with, with Mike and, and other people talking about Yes. What should be our theory, our strategy? What is our? What do we believe? Yes. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there was. Uh, I came around. My beginning with Rising Up Angry came around because of my identification as the film guy in Chicago. My background was in uh, media. I had worked. Uh, uh, I had gone to college on and off. When I graduated. I worked at Channel 11, the public television station in Chicago. Wasn't they, they hadn't even conceived of public television. Then they called it educational television. Uh, but I worked there in the years before the Corporation of Public Broadcasting was formed, from 65 to 67. Uh, what drew me out of there was, uh, and I have to say, my one major movement act, um, engaged act in that period of time was going to sell my Alabama uh, in 1965. After uh, the bloody Sunday on the bridge, uh, I had just finished finished up at, at college and was. Um, uh, thinking about what I was going to do and actually thinking that I was going to get drafted uh, and how I was going to deal with that and uh, some people said we should go down there and I knew it was right and I went and it was an incredibly enlightening experience um, uh, and I came back with the idea well I'll go to work at the television station and see if I can use media towards some social good. But didn't really, I can't really say I was in the civil rights movement. When you went was, down south, uh, what group of people did you go with? I just went with some people that I was hanging with in, in um, uh, Evanston, Illinois, where I had gone to college. Northwestern? Yeah, Northwestern. It's, an, it's a, a community adjacent to Chicago. It's across the street from Chicago, a college suburb. And I was still living there in this apartment, actually getting ready uh, to move back into my um, uh, mom and dad's house to prepare to go to uh, 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 to go into the service. Uh, at the time, I, I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I, I, I hadn't heard of it. And I was actually seriously considering uh, enlisting in the service uh, to learn my trade. Uh, I'd, uh, I knew some people who had learned to do television work. I wasn't really thinking about film then. What field of study were you in at college? Was it liberal arts or just? Yeah, liberal arts. Uh, I, 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 I made the suggestion earlier, or, or said I, I was in and out of college. It's, it's actually a much simpler story than that. I had a very unsuccessful first year and I flunked out. And I had to get a job, and my job was in fact at, that, at the television station where I got on the stage crew. It was not a union shop there. And I basically learned how to do uh, a lot of technical stuff of stringing the cables and setting the lights and uh, got me very, and also observed uh, the kind of shows they were doing and got me really excited about uh, about television. I was a very much a child of TV. I was, I was kind of there when it, when it first came around. What year were you born? I was born in 1943. I was in, uh, in grammar school in the, in, uh, in the early 50s, in high school in the late 50s, and started college in 1960. Well, I, uh, we weren't the first in the neighborhood to get a TV, but, but TV was, uh, there was very little of it to watch. And it's what they what's known now historically as the golden age of television, and that's what I watched when I was a kid coming up with with uh, the, you know they did live theater on TV, serious theater. Some of the best movies that came out of that were originally teleplays and were on TV. Um, uh, and 
and so I was I was excited about TV, um, and that's where I wanted to work. So I got this job at the television station, and then when I went back to college, um, mainly I don't know I'm not sure why I went back. It was more out of pride than anything else. I had never really failed at anything before, uh, and I felt that flunking out of college was a failure in a number of ways, not the most not just the obvious ones. But I really left my uh, I hadn't even thought seriously about going to college. My dad had never gone to college, and I was his pride and joy, and he, he was going to go to college through me. And I didn't even consider that, and I messed that up. And I felt really bad, and he was pretty angry, and so it was more social than anything that I went to. And college, wow, it somehow, it, it, it was, my, my family had enough money. I had a middle class upbringing, and it, it wasn't the kind of expenditure as it is today. Um, you know, it, uh, yeah, and, and I took some of that responsibility on as well, but there were no loans involved. When I got through with college, I didn't know anything. Well, obviously, to my, I owed a debt to my family who stood behind me and sent me there, but I didn't know anything. Um, so I decided when I went back that I wouldn't study TV or film, which they did offer at Northwestern, uh, because I had just learned it. And they paid me to learn it. That seems silly. And I sensed, I articulate better today than I did then, but I sensed that, uh, that the media was about telling stories. So I should, just, I should study telling stories. And I studied, uh, you know, uh, novels and poems and plays and some art history, telling stories and pictures. And it was the first, the first year that they instituted some kind of interdisciplinary studies at the university. And I was part of the the first class that was uh, got degrees in uh, comparative literature. Um, so you know, I read some European stuff. It, it was early '60s, and it wasn't. It was, nobody was around me, including myself, was uh, forward-looking enough to look past, uh, uh, you know, a Eurocentric uh, reading list. Um, you know, I read the, I read the Greeks and the, and the Romans, but we didn't read the African literature or Asian literature. You know, I wish I could do it again today. I would have a lot different reading list. So anyway, I I decided I, I figured uh, telling stories uh, would be a way to do it. You didn't have a background in a lot of travel. You you, you have a sympathy or an understanding of different cultures. Did you get it in at Northwestern, or did, what were your experiences that led you? to trying to understand how the Vietnamese felt about things or Cubans or anybody else. Well, I'd say it, it, it began uh, early on uh, in, uh, in my neighborhood that while there were, we, we lived in uh, Wrigleyville in that time, Lakeview really was the official name of the neighborhood, uh, was, had a large Asian community. I don't know exactly why. Uh, I, I think a lot of it built after the war, uh, but some of it was before. There's, there is uh, famously, there was a, a family and a shop on Belmont Avenue near where I live where the infamous Tokyo Rose operated the store. She came back after the war. She was, I don't know exactly what the legalities of it, if she was excused for what she did, which was Tokyo Rose, for those of you who don't know, was was a woman, uh, an American uh, Japanese who spent the war in Japan, uh, fluent in English, and uh, talking to, sending a, a pro-Japanese propaganda to American soldiers over there. Well, our family operated uh, in the community, and anyway, it was, so there was a, a big Japanese community, so I had a number of Asians, uh, uh, went to my high school and grammar school, uh, a number of uh, American Indians. Uh, uh, Lakeview was adjacent to a community known as Uptown, which you've heard a lot about in the interviews, because that's where Appalachians white came. White you know, Lakeview High. I did. How did you know that? Did I say that somehow? How did you know I went to Lakeview? Well, it makes sense because I grew up in Lakeview. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Uh, adjacent to uh, Lakeview was uh, the Uptown community, which people, other people have talked a lot about, about the, how it, uh, after the war, through Appalachian Whites, it was very poor. American Indians lived there as well. 
uh, and then later on an African Americans movie, but that wasn't in my time. So there were very few African Americans in my in my sphere, uh, but uh, uh, Spanish speaking people had already uh, started to move in. A lot of Filipinos for some reason. In school with a lot of Filipinos, but and this is key to rising up angry. Uh, more important to that and less to the question of accepting third world leadership and, and why I would support, come to the position that I would support the Viet Cong uh, was that there were huge class disparities. I shouldn't say it that way. There was every, every economic class was represented, particularly at my high school. Because of the adjacency to uh, Uptown, we had some of the poorest kids. Because of, of the east side of the, uh, of the school district being Lakeshore Drive, Sheridan Road, where, where actually wealthy people lived as well as middle class people. And then all between, because Chicago neighborhoods, and particularly Lakeview, were made up with small factories. Residential neighborhoods built around small factories people would walk to work. There were a lot of working class people too. So before I knew what the term class analysis was, I had one because that's what I went to, went to school with. Uh, the, and the fact that I uh, uh, I played sports, I was, a, I was a mediocre football player. I was on the football team. And I, I choose those words carefully because if I say I played football at high school, uh, I wouldn't be telling the truth because I didn't play very often. I was like the last guy on the team. One of the jokes is that uh, there was there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism there, and I was identified as a Jew. Was that we had a quota on the football team for two Jews, one who would be large enough, fast enough, have a good wealth and a good enough ability to be chosen as all conference or all city, and one that could fit in a locker. Um, and I was the one that fit in the locker, which is sort of, I mean, I can't say that I was actually shoved in a locker at any time, but, but there was a lot of uh, Jew this and Jew that, and we like you, but your people this and your people that, and I kind of, uh, kind of experienced a certain underdog in this there. But for some reason I picked up on these, on these differences, although they weren't play, played up as much. Uh, in the 50s as as they are now. I mean, maybe we just weren't aware of the diversity. But when I think back at the guys that I ran with in the playground at Lemoyne School, which is right east of Wrigley Field, separated by the, by the L tracks, I mean, we had, a, it was like some, uh, some uh, World War II movie. I mean, we had a German kid, we had an Irish kid, we had a Jewish kid, we had a Catholic this kid, we had the American Indian. I mean, it, it was like that, and it just seemed, no, no, and I, I remember actually being attracted. The United Nations was formed in my uh, childhood, and I remember thinking about that stuff. That wouldn't it be cool if people could just get along, and and and, and even had early thoughts of um, uh, 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 what am I? Foreign relations and stuff. You know, going to be, you know, going in government in the State Department or something like that. I should tell you that I grew up in a politically active family, but not on the left, uh, unless you consider liberal the left, not the radical left. I had no experience. I was asking, uh, kind of, the question where I was going is, is what event politicized you or radicalized you, whatever term you might use? One particular, well, there was Selma. But what, what radicalized me most about the war was the very same thing that Steve Tappas was telling me yesterday. I could almost not help but jump in, but I wanted to let him tell his story. I too was at the Pentagon in October of 1967, but in a, in a very different way than Steve. I had my only, as I just told you, my only uh, involvement in the movement was at Selma. And I hadn't done anything uh, about the anti-war movement. The, I bet my most active uh, thing I think, was to subscribe to Rampart's magazine so that uh, my politics about about imperialism, what I learned later to be imperialism and stuff, and war was that wars were bad. That's all. That's basically what I thought. War is bad. You don't want to kill anybody. But uh, I got drawn in to the. I, I went to Washington. I'm trying to think whether this part of the story is really relevant. 
because I, I, went, I went to Washington not only because I was developing an idea that I was against the war, but I was also looking for a film crew that I had a job with. And in, in some kind of bizarre way, I, I got this job that if I could find the people, they would hire me. They were making a movie, a documentary about Norman Mailer, who famously participated and was arrested. Uh, and actually, if you read his book about the Pentagon, he talks about when he first gets out of jail in the morning in the bright light, the first friendly faces he sees are those of the film crew that are filming his documentary. I went to the Pentagon looking for that film crew. I found them when they got back, and I went to work with them then. But I couldn't find them, and what I did find was myself facing this line of soldiers with bayonets. Uh, it was one of the most exciting things. It equaled the excitement of Selma. I really got taken up in the rush. I was actually wearing a sport coat and a tie, and there's all these hippies around, and all this stuff that's going on, and all of a sudden I got taken up in the rush of the people rushing the Pentagon. And I always liked that. I was not... Uh, you know, I was like, I, I wasn't any kind of tough guy or anything, but I always liked a good scramble. I liked that football. I liked the contact with the football. I didn't mind getting knocked down. I kind of got taken in with that. I kind of elbowed the, shoulder, the, the soldiers and stuff, and we broke in the way that, that Steve goes. And all of a sudden, I found myself on the inside of it, in the group that was close to the Pentagon, the group that was told, if you don't leave, you'll be arrested. I wasn't ready to be arrested. And I, uh, had after staying a long time and really picking up on the vibe there, I chose to shinny down the wall. They threw some ropes. They said, if you don't want to be arrested, you could leave. You need, I don't know if you knew this, that I was at the Pentagon with you. When you were telling you the story me, you yesterday. Told that, you told me that story yesterday. You were oh. taking pictures. You were the newsreel. No, I, no, no, no. I had nothing to do with newsreel yet. I was just there looking looking for some people, but also thinking I was going to be in the, in the anti-war movement. And I got sucked up in it like you I, I mean you could use I could use the same words. Hey Tom. Okay man. Great to see you. Good All right. All right. Hey we get up nice park up. Meeting, you know Maybe the funny thing is when I was going to work for my rules exam stuff, I was going to work for the park. Oh, yeah? I couldn't remember where you were.